While today we measure beauty in the totally healthy way of number of hearts on a thirst trap pic on Instagram, in the mid 20th century for white middle class America, beauty was measured the old fashioned way through slogs of corporate sponsored, hyper specific, weird as hell beauty pageants. Hi, I'm Dylan and this is not exactly normal. What you don't see when I'm standing here in the upside down is just over there is my terrible, horrible, no good, very bad desk. I've had it since literally the fourth grade. It's moved with me many times. It's messy. The edges are peeling. There's wires everywhere. It sucks. Which is why I was pretty pumped when Autonomous reached out and wanted to sponsor this video by upgrading my setup, as the kids call it, with a standing desk. Once I had disassembled my mess of wires, the Autonomous Smart Desk 2 was pretty quick and easy to put together. After the desk was up, I kitted it out with a new monitor, light, and simplified all my wiring. Then we had liftoff. Three, two, one, zero. All engines running, commit. Liftoff, we have liftoff. One thing I really like about this desk is that it's actually a great size. Whenever I would look to replace my desk in the past, I was always put off because so many desks these days are really shallow. Whereas the autonomous desk gives me room for everything that I need. You can custom set up to four heights. So if you are sharing with a partner, they can have their own height set as well. I was also super impressed by just how quiet it is. And weirdly, the sound that it does make is quite satisfying. I did not think that I would be a standing desk person, but when you're at home all day, it's great to be able to work while you're standing. I find this super helpful when I'm doing things around the house and I can pop over to my desk and answer an email without having to plop down in my chair and then stand back up. Standing desks are my new normal and there's no going back. Overall, if you're looking for a stylish standing desk at a really good price, the Autonomous Smart Desk 2 is a great choice. It's the most affordable standing desk on the market and if you follow the link in the description and use my promo code, you can get 8% off your Autonomous Smart Desk 2. While most of the big beauty pageants still exist, like Miss Universe. This is exactly what's on the card. I will take responsibility for this. Miss Teen USA. I personally believe that US Americans are unable to do so. And the myriad of nightmares showcased on toddlers and tiaras. These tribal contests pitting bikini clad women against each other have largely lost their place on the cultural main stage. Today, the only time people really talk about beauty pageants is when something really exciting happens. Like last year when Camille Schreier, a biochemist, won the 2020 Miss America competition after making elephant toothpaste. Now in my flax are concentrated hydrogen peroxide, food coloring, and dish soap. I'm about to pour in potassium iodide, my catalyst, which will start the breakdown. Now this reaction is very simple. It only produces three things, water, oxygen, gas, and heat. But beauty pageants used to be a much bigger deal and the peak pageant era was real weird. After that strange pair of eyes distinctly out of this world, let's focus ours on some pairs of eyes also out of this world, but very much more pleasantly so. Reason for our interest is a competition at this Clacton holiday camp to find the girl with the most beautiful eyes. And to ensure the judges are not influenced by a pretty face, for once, you'll notice yashmaks are worn for the occasion. The oldest pageant that is still running is the Miss America pageant, which started in 1921 as a scheme by Atlantic City hotel owners to keep tourists around for the two weeks following Labor Day. And that really is the root of all beauty pageants. Corporations using attractive women, and in some cases men too, in swimwear in order to bring in customers. While the corporate branding of early Miss America contests could be described as subtle, other brand run beauty contests lacked, to use one of their own words, poise. Poise counts! It's just as important as the others. Perhaps one of the least subtle brand run beauty pageants were the hot dog ones. Yes, there were hot dog beauty contests. Welcome to America. Not that I live there. Again, panel, would you follow along on this affidavit? I, Irene Wassercourt, am the 1959 hot dog queen. <laughs> Appropriately enough, I am from Frankfurt, Germany. I was selected for this honor from among 128 girls by the American consulate in Frankfurt. Yes, in the 1950s, various hot dog producing companies crowned yearly hot dog queens in an effort to boost sales. The photos are, let's say phallic would be putting it lightly. 
Hebrew National named a Frankfurter Queen in their yearly Miss Fabulous Frankfurter contest, while the Zion Meat Company crowned a Sausage Queen for National Hot Dog Month, which apparently is the entire month of July. Many of the hot dog queens were selected by a Queen Selection Committee run by the National Hot Dog Month Council, an intellectual bunch who would interview as many as 300 women a year to be one of the eight crowned hot dog queens. But the hot dog queens had real responsibilities. This wasn't some sort of joke job. You know, heavy as the head that wears the hot dog crown, especially if it's Juicy Jumbos. Their role was to travel from state to state to launch the National Hot Dog Month, meet with mayors, officials, and media outlets to promote hot dogs and to show off new recipes to try with hot dogs, like baking them in a carton of sour cream or boiling them in beer, as well as to inform people just how nutritious hot dogs really are. Did you know that each hot dog only has 120 calories? Also, they say the average American eats 62 a year. The more you know. But most importantly, they taught people how to eat hot dogs, a lesson I didn't think we needed to learn, but apparently we did. And the answer was with your fingers. Yeah, makes sense. Most of the reporting about the hot dog queens gets uncomfortably into the women's physical dimensions, going as far as to include their weight and their actual measurements. A bit of an odd detail to focus on for a person who is queen of processed meat. There were so many industries in on this gimmick. There's the swimsuit wearing donut queens, there's Miss Pickle, the Florida Egg Queen, Cranberry Queen, the Pumpkin Festival Queen, and the unfortunately probably more relevant today 1947 Diaper Queen, sponsored of course by the Diaper Service Institute of America. Who else? Another big one was the Potato Queens. These are some of the earlier Pageant Plus products out there, and they would usually take place at potato festivals. The photos are pretty scandalous for their time. This one is of Miss Idaho Potato from 1935. Other spud queens were sponsored by the potato chip industry and featured a swimwear portion, as basically all pageants do, but this time the top was made out of chips. Comfy. Many of these types of contests were very popular in holiday camps. If you haven't heard of them before, holiday camps were middle-class domestic vacation resorts built on the coast that were meant for the whole family. As traveling internationally was very expensive, these domestic escapes accessible by train or car were quite popular in the UK and the States. They were also super weird. These camps had all sorts of activities that adults could partake in, and to me, resemble a fever dream I once had. One of the many strange things I got up to during these big summer vacations was beauty contests. There has to be a beauty contest, of course. No holiday camp would be complete without that. But not just regular beauty contests, they got real specific. Some of the girls, like Pamela Kemp here from Chelmsford, Essex, are pretty enough to win most ordinary beauty contests. But the new idea is really to give a chance to the girl who isn't necessarily the pin-up type, but yet has lovely eyes. Of course, if it catches on, we might well have competitions for beautiful ears and even noses. That was the Beautiful Eyes contest, held at a holiday camp in Essex in 1958. And I will say that a masked beauty contest is actually very 2021. You'll have noticed before that the girls are dressed quite informally. Bathing suits are out. And to make doubly sure the judges are not distracted, they're only visible from the neck up. Mind you, now we know why women in the Middle East look so, so intriguing. At first, you might think that the idea of an eyes-only beauty contest could be interesting, and it might not get sucked into the whole body shaming thing that traditionally accompanies beauty contests. But then, there's this. Needless to say, the judges have to be strictly impartial. But with a contest as new as this, and girls as provocative as 19-year-old Pauline Mitchell here, it's small wonder they get carried away once or twice. So yeah, not good. Towards the end, the judges had one thing in common, bloodshot eyes. Beautiful eyes contests have been going on for a really long time, and while I do like the hip masks that they wore at that holiday camp in Essex, some of the other face coverings were pretty novel and weird. At the Miss Lovely Eyes pageant in Florida in 1930, the contestants wore what looked like cut up pie plates over their faces, but my favorite was a contest from 1936 in Cliftonville that saw women covering their faces with what looks like traffic pylons with eye holes cut out. Now that's hot. Isolating and judging individual body parts was quite a popular trend. There were ankle competitions where the women hid behind a blind, just body competitions where the women wore spooky masks, and leg competitions that I'm told are for sure not clan rallies. There are also a handful of beauty contests for men. Most prominently were the novelty knees contests. 
This holiday camp favorite saw men trot around in shorts and then make their way on stage to model their knees, squatting to show off just how knobbly they were. The panel of judges would deliberate and award the man with the knobbliest knees. So you know, not exactly the same thing as a swimsuit contest. The judge has a problem too. In fairness to everybody, he has to ignore the foundation and give all his marks to the creation. Anybody who can do that in the circumstances deserves a prize himself. But the peak weird beauty pageants belong to the chiropractors. It's Cairo Town. <laughs> One of these x-rays shows you the spine of the world's queen of posture and physical fitness. What is your name, please? My name is F.J. Johnson. Throughout the 1950s and 60s, there was a series of beauty pageants across the United States and here in Canada focused primarily on spinal health. These beauty pageants named posture queens by taking x-rays of their spines and using scales to measure their posture. The pageants were dreamed up by various chiropractors and chiropractic associations around the country in hopes of bringing some legitimacy to their businesses. While more and more states were licensing chiropractors, they were often still viewed as quacks. These posture pageants let people focus on posture being beautiful and healthy and show that chiropractors were the ones that could help you with your posture. Of course, in hindsight, needlessly exposing people to radiation probably caused a lot more problems than the posture queens ever solved. Will the real? S.J. Johnson, please stand up, straight. <laughs> While you might think that this is the perfect beauty contest, a beauty contest about literal inner beauty, unfortunately, the contestants were also judged on their outer beauty. And of course, poise. Poise counts! It's a really bad Kramer. Oh, and in case you were hoping that this could be at least the one beauty pageant without a swimwear section, often the women in the posture pageants were x-rayed in swimwear. Because nothing says spinal health like a one piece. These contests spread across the country, and soon they would form regional and statewide competitions, with the finals being held in fancy ballrooms and upscale hotels with live music. The winners would be awarded a tiara, a massive backbreaking trophy, a sash naming them Posture Queen, and a variety of prizes, including a chiropractic scholarship. As far as I can find, the last reported posture pageant was held in 1969. As people began to trust chiropractors more, they didn't really need the free press. And while the world may have forgotten about this weird blip in medical history, we'll never forget our Posture Queens or their spines. So what should I talk about next? Please let me know in the comments and be sure to subscribe for new episodes of Not Exactly Normal as often as I can make them. Thanks for watching and stand up straight.